Alexandria Joy Lowitzer, Allie to those who loved her most, was a 16-year-old from Spring, Texas. She had a boyfriend and just started a new job. On the afternoon of April 26, 2010, Allie got off the school bus at a regular stop. She had permission to walk to her job to get her paycheck. Allie never arrived. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Unfound as it is now constructed serves a lot of different purposes. Many more than I ever could have imagined when I started doing this over five years ago. Sure, there is publicity, bringing attention to disappearances. That is its most obvious role. Then there is education, something I discuss every month during the Unfound Now episodes. I want all of you to understand why these people go missing. For the guests, there is the analysis I do, using other disappearances as examples. This can often help the guests find new avenues of inquiry and investigation. There is also networking. Unfound has been able to introduce guests to others who have had disappearances happen to them, further increasing the feeling of community. This networking also takes the form of guests talking to other experts in hopes progress can be made. Well, with the disappearance of Ali Lowitzer, I feel like Unfound will be doing something totally different this time. Because after 11 years, her disappearance is still unsolved, despite the trail going to other states. Maybe it's time to get this investigation back on track. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Lyonez's website, charlieproject.org. Allie Lowitzer was your typical 16-year-old girl. In fact, 11 years later, this is what makes her disappearance so perplexing. She had friends. She was in the band. She was in the chorus. Allie had a boyfriend who got the stamp of approval from her parents. She had just gotten her first job that was walking distance from her house. The only big issue was that during the current school year, two girls had bullied Allie on the bus, something that was serious enough that Allie's grandmother would wait at the house for her to come home every day. So after school on April 26, 2010, Allie took the bus home. During the trip, Allie convinced her mother to allow her to walk to her job to get a paycheck. Allie got off the bus with a couple of other students. They went one way, she went the other. A witness later stated she saw Allie standing at a stop sign near the bus stop. Allie seemed to be texting on her phone. She never arrived at the job. She was never seen again. Over the past 11 years, the search for Allie has taken investigators the whole way to Ohio, with the allegation being that somebody sex trafficked her. That lead came to a dead end, with law enforcement finding no proof Allie was ever in that state. Allie's disappearance has been covered by a wide array of programs, TV shows, and podcasts over the past 11 years. Her family has gotten assistance from both local and national investigators. In fact, Allie has to be one of the more well-known missing people we've covered on Unfound. Well, now it's our turn to see what we can do to move the proverbial ball forward. 
that starts by all of you contemplating these three questions. Number one, did Allie really intend to go to her job that day, or was going to her job a cover to do something else? Number two, given that Allie once wrote about running away, should this be a consideration for her disappearance? And number three, is it a coincidence that Allie went missing on the only day her grandmother was not waiting at home for her? Allie's family is open to different theories, but they completely reject the idea that she ran away all on her own. The guest for this episode is Allie's mother, Joanne Lowitzer. Unfound news. My perception is that I caused a bit of a stir earlier this week when I posted a video analysis of Brian Schaefer with those two women on the night he disappeared to the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube. Does it look to you like Brian slipped a cell phone or something into that woman's purse? Please decide for yourself. Next, if you're wondering why there have been no unfound books recently, I once again ran into some publishing problems. So I've now resolved to work on getting a literary agent who can then find a publisher who can create the books on its own. If any of you are or know a good agent, please contact me. Finally, my assistant Natasha has decided to move on. She worked for Unfound for about two years, and I have nothing but great things to say about her and her work. However, it means I am looking for a new website slash YouTube person. If you have decent experience in both areas, let me know. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on iTunes, Pandora, Audible, Podomatic, Spotify, iHeart, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Deezer, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the Unfound live show. Watch, ask questions, and give the show a thumbs up. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. I also need to give a huge shout out to all the people who have monetarily contributed using Super Chat during the live show on Wednesday nights. Thank you for watching and thank you for donating. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The merchandise, the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound podcast.myshopify.com. Or you can track down my assistant Heather in the Facebook group. Playing cards at makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com and please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the mother of Allie Lowitzer, Joanne Lowitzer. Joanne, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's start here as we usually do when we have mothers on the program. Tell us a little bit about your family, um, how many children do you have, uh, the dynamic, uh, the dynamics of the Lowitzer family, outgoing, uh, kind of the strong, silent type. How would you explain uh, your family, of course, including Allie and any other children you have? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I do have uh, two children, uh, Allie and her older brother, Mason. Um. I, well, me and um, Allie's dad are divorced. Oh. Uh, we weren't at the time that she went missing, but we are now. Okay. Um, and I would say that uh, most of the time we kind of, you know, kept to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
you know, although, you know, we did have the kids activities in school and, you know, mm-hmm. work stuff. And, um, so I don't, I don't know how you would, <laughs> uh-huh. how you would, would you say yeah. that the, the, the Lowitzer uh, house in 2010 was a bustling, uh, place, people doing things, going places, people having their own schedules at, at that time? Well, not necessarily bustling. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I guess it was mainly Allie, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because uh, she was still in high school. So oh. we had uh, Girl Scout softball choir. Yeah. Um, you know, me and John both worked uh, full time jobs. Okay. Um, so, you know, I would say it was busy, but not uh, not uncontrollable. Okay. I would say normal. <laughs> OK, uh, Mason. And how much older is he than than Allie? He's three years older. Three years older. So was he at home at the time of her disappearance, or did he go to college? Do you have a job? What was he doing in April of 2010? Um, he did have a job. Um, he, I don't remember if at the time he was taking classes. Okay. Um, it's been eleven years. I I, under, I totally I I understand I totally understand. I guess what I guess what I'm asking is he was out of high school at this point that yes. she, she went yes. missing. Okay, mm-hmm. did he and Allie go to the same high school or different schools? Uh, it was the same high school. Okay, yes. let's uh, move on to this. Let's talk a little bit about Allie. Of course, she was 16 years old at the time of her disappearance. How would you explain? Uh, her personality, her interests. You've already brought up uh, Girl Scouts and things. Um, how would you uh, explain for all, of course, the people who never have gotten to meet her yet, um, how would you explain her personality and, you know, how she handled things? Um, I, I will say that she was, I don't know if I'd say typical or not, but, mm-hmm. you know, she was definitely a uh, 16-year-old with uh, mm-hmm. the teenager hormones and mm-hmm. attitude to go with it. Yeah. Um, but she, um, from, you know, of course, you know, I have to say that every parent doesn't completely know their child 100% in and out. True. Um, so, so for the parent's perspective... Um, you know, we thought that she was, you know, a little quiet and shy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she, what she was passionate about, um, Mm -hmm. she was all over it, you know, like, um, her music and her friends and her art, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and her animals as well. You know, uh, Hmm. those are the things that we feel she was passionate about and, Mm -hmm. um, but when we talked to some of her friends after she went missing, they're like, oh, yeah, Allie was, you know, outgoing. And, yeah. you know, she would, you know, always talk to people. And <laughs> so right, okay. I, I, I've gotten to know her a little bit more after she went missing, sadly. Yeah, um, uh, maybe that's, uh, I think probably that's a very common thing for parents. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I, hey, I, even, I don't have any children, but I was a child at one time and surely... My parents, uh, for a long time, saw a certain part of me. Not that it was fake or anything, but, you know, around my friends, a little bit different. Sure. And, you know, so very sure. common. So what you're explaining is very common. Would you say that Allie was popular in school? Um, well, my first instinct, instinct is to say I don't think so. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, because uh, we've had her in the news and yeah. social media. Everybody is her friend. Yeah, um, right. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. I I would say that I I really don't think so. Okay. I don't think she was that like one of those mm-hmm. it girl. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, but she had friends. You said she had friends. Then you've gotten to speak to them over the years. Yes. All right. So she had friends. That's the most important part. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we know that she was involved. In all, all these activities, music, did she play an instrument or something or, or what? Um, she, in junior high school, she was in the band and she learned to play the flute. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. And then in the ninth grade, uh, she quit band and joined choir. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was also learning to play the guitar. Yeah, neat. Okay. Uh, how did you, how was she as a student in school? How was she? Um. 
she wasn't, she was not an A student. Um, she got that from me. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, my favorite uh, class was, of course, art. And, uh, you know, of course, it was hers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she struggled, um, just mm-hmm. like me. She did enough to get by and pass every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, okay. she was... She, Good student, but not like a straight A student. Okay, you wouldn't say uh, if she wasn't getting straight A's, it was not because she was lazy. That's just the way it was. She yeah, she tried yeah, to do the best she could, good. and that was just the way it was. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't you know disruptive or anything like mm. that. Uh, her conduct was good. Um, it's just that you know she had her struggles. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, this job that she had at the time of her disappearance. Of course, it, it does play seemingly some sort of role because she was uh, seemingly going to walk there the day she disappeared. But do you remember how it even came about that she got this job? Was this something that you recommended or did she bring it up to you? What do you remember? Um, well, she had just turned 16 uh, in February. And I know for a, a couple of months, um, uh, John was, you know, taking her to the mall to fill out applications, letting her learn to drive, you know, every now and then, um, she really wanted a job. She wanted to be able to have her own spending money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't remember if someone recommended her, uh, to, to apply at the burger barn or, mm-hmm. um, I'm thinking that maybe, because I know that John had really um, focused on helping her find a job. So okay. um, it, it may have been, you know, the two of them go up there to that strip center mm-hmm. and um, fill out applications for different. There's a pizza place and a mm-hmm. restaurant and a vet clinic and, you know, all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff in the area. And, so, she, and she could maybe just go from one to the next, right? Going down there, see if they needed somebody. Yeah. Okay, that's very convenient. And of course, this is also very close to your house, so that would have been convenient for you and your husband who might have to drive her back and forth or something. Yes. Yeah, she could just walk, maybe. Mm, mm. Well, we didn't really we, want her wouldn't to. Walk. Okay, but it yeah. was it was conveniently close. It was like yeah. a five or seven minute round trip or something by, by car. Yeah. Okay. All right, so she's working there. Did she start working there in like March then? Of, tw- yes, of 2010? Yes. Okay, so yes. she'd been working there about a month, maybe a little over a month before she went missing. And what do you remember about, did she ever have any comments about working there? Do you think that she liked it? Did she, did she have other friends who might, did she did she make friends there? Any idea about her time there? Um, She did like it. Um, I know that she became close with, um, one of the other ladies that had worked there for quite a bit. I know she was doing some sketches for her and her husband. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think she had any friends that worked there at the same time, but I do know that she had friends that had worked there okay. uh, and uh, became friends with um, their delivery driver. And his name was Crash. Huh. Uh, that was his nickname. <laughs> Yeah, I was, kind of, I was guessing that was a nickname. That would have been funny, though, if it was his real name. That would be kind of neat. Okay. All right, so you think uh, your impression, once again, 11 years later, 11 and a half years later, is that uh, had she not gone missing, that she would have continued to work there because she liked working there? Um, well, because of some of the other things that we found out after she went missing, mm-hmm. uh, I feel would have come to light as well and we probably would have had her quit oh okay well we will have to get into that at the appropriate time uh in this interview somewhere uh later okay so uh, we will talk about everything we found out after uh later in this interview so but at the time in 2010 you thought things were fine at the burger barn as far as you could tell yes all right so at the time that's that's what you thought okay Let's move on to, uh, and maybe I should ask you this. How often did she work there? How many hours was she putting in a week? Of course, she had school, so obviously she was part-time, but how many hours? Um, it was random, um, mm-hmm. and it was almost like she had to call in every day and ask if she could work. 
Uh, wow. I'm really strange. Um, you know, I'm like, why don't, why doesn't he make a schedule? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay. So she didn't have a set schedule. It was, like you said, she had to call in, which sounds a little bit inconvenient for her. Yes. Okay. So maybe that could have affected whether she was also going to continue to work there or not. Okay. Let's uh, move on to uh, some boys. Uh, we're just going to use their first names. Uh, who Their names have popped up over the last uh, 11 years. And we're just going to talk about them in general right now. Just in very general terms. I just want the listeners to be familiar with these names as uh, we go forward in this interview. Uh, who was DJ? Uh, DJ was her new boyfriend. Okay, and were they, did they go to school together then? Yes. Okay, in the same grade, um, was he older? Do you know? Um, I want to say, I think he was in ninth grade. Oh, I think. you're younger then? I think so. Okay, and did he live uh, close to where you lived at the time? At the time? Um, fairly close. He lived in a different subdivision. Mm -hmm. Um. I would say maybe not quite two miles. Okay. All right. And being that he was maybe in ninth grade, I'm guessing he didn't drive, didn't have a car. Correct. Okay. Did you ever meet him? I did, yes. He was He was at our house the weekend before she went missing. Okay. Did you have a uh, favorable opinion of him at the time? Um, I liked him. I okay. thought he was very sweet. Um. He was polite, but, you know, most uh, <laughs> kids, their friends' uh, parents are going to be nice. Sure. Uh, but no red flags, you know. Um, uh, he seemed like he had a really nice personality. Okay, so it wasn't one of these situations. As soon as he left the house, you turned to Allie and said, you can never see that guy again. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. That'll, that'll probably put it in a nice little nutshell there. Okay, uh, Aaron, uh, in general, who is he? Uh, Aaron, uh, grew up with Allie. He lives on the next block from us. And, uh, would you say then that the two knew each other well? Yes. Okay, did they, like, hang out in school? Uh, were they in the same grade? Uh, yes, they were the same grade. Um, I, I'm not sure about the classes that they had, uh, together, mm -hmm. but I do know that they had the, um, some mutual friends, and they would hang out um, after school and on weekends. Okay. With the kids. Okay. Uh, your opinion of him at the time? Of course, there are things maybe that have popped up since, but at the time in 2010, your general opinion of him? Um, I, I just thought he was a friend. Okay. Uh, I didn't think anything different. Okay. Uh, I do have it in my notes. Uh, is there a suspicion that you had that maybe he liked Allie a little more than she liked him? Yes. Uh, she had expressed to me um, there were um, Aaron and his friend Alan um, that had both started asking her out. Okay. He ended up um, going with Alan to, I think, the homecoming dance that year. She wasn't really happy about it. I guess she mm. felt obligated or, mm. um, what's the other word? Uh, 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 she, she felt it, bad. Felt that, like, make, uh, yeah. Her, yeah, I'm looking for the word too, uh, Joanne. Um, kind of guilted yeah. into it. Guilted, yes. Okay, yeah, thank Guilted into it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So but, they were friends, but he liked her in a, maybe in a different way than she liked him. Once again, your impression in 2010. Yes. Okay. And uh, so he's 16. Do you think that he had a car or could he drive? Do you know? Um, Aaron did not know. Did not. Okay. Let's move on to the last uh, boy, although... My understanding is he is uh, a bit older than Allie and both a bit older in, than Aaron and, and DJ as well. His name is Jay. Who is he? Uh, what do you know about him, your impressions of him at the time? Uh, Jay, I had met on uh, several occasions um, because he did drive 
um, he came over to the house a few times and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, seemed like a a nice boy, of course. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I didn't like the fact that he already drove. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and and you had told me, I think that he had a car, but he had been held back a year. So he might've been like 17, right? Or did you tell me that, that he was held back a year or something? I think so, because um, mm-hmm. I know that, I, I believe that, you know, they, him and Allie met because they had a class together, okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so you had met him, but uh, of those three boys, would you say that you knew Aaron the best because he lived in the neighborhood, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. All right. And regarding Jay, he had a car, but did he live close? He lived with, I guess, his parents or one parent, whoever. Um, did he live close to where you lived at the time? Um, no, he did not live real close. Um, I would say it's it's far enough where it probably wouldn't even be safe to ride a bicycle. You know, you have to okay. cross the main or farm road and wow. stuff like that. So, okay. Yeah, it's a good- would you say it was five miles away or further, farther than that? or um, maybe, maybe like six or seven, maybe. Okay. All right. So, and we have to remember, we're talking Spring, Texas. This is a city. Five or six, seven miles, a lot further in the city than it would be in the country. All right. So, we have Jay. We have Aaron. We have DJ. DJ, I guess we would say, is the official boyfriend Aaron is uh, the guy who seemed to like Allie more than she liked him. And then Jay, uh, your understanding is she and Jay were just friends. There was nothing uh, of romantic nature going on there. Or what do you think? Once again, at the time, what did you think? Well, at the time, I believe Allie, him and Allie had an interest in each other. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was actually defined or not. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I thought at first that he was just a friend. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and these names are going to come up uh, later, once again, due to uh, things that popped up, information that popped up after her disappearance. Now, I do have to ask you about this uh, because it, it is out there, um, you know, after 11 years, maybe it's been made too much of it, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to uh, talk about it as much as you'd like. Uh, there is this uh, information out there. At one time, Allie had written about or spoken about running away. Uh, can you tell the listeners about that? When did that happen? When did you find out about this? And it is, is it something that, that you take seriously? Or is this just uh, a teenager just kind of um, daydreaming? What, how do you look at it? Well, what had happened... Um you know, with any, uh, police investigation, you know, Mm -hmm. they come in and look in your house and, you know, specifically Allie's room. Mm -hmm. So, um, to describe Allie's room, um, she had her dresser, of course, where drawers are. She had a desk with, um, like an overhead, uh, hutch type of deal. And she had a nightstand next to her bed. And, uh, in the, in the nightstand, um, uh, down underneath where uh, is where Allie would keep all of her, uh, journals. It was those typical black cover journals, you know, mm-hmm. which is the p- ruled pages. And, okay. um, they found lots and lots of those. Uh, we're probably talking like maybe 10. Wow. Well, Allie was, a, she was a creative writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it was very typical of her. Okay. Um, the writing and um so they were skimming through all of those didn't ever find anything uh Mm -hmm. lots of drawings and stuff but um they were looking inside of uh the hutch where her desk is and found you know lots of her books and stuff like that Mm -hmm. well they were looking through some spiral notebooks um like she would have used for school yeah and all by itself on one page um she had written like a runaway letter um real short like three or four sentences and that was it Mm -hmm. and Allie always um 
she likes signs and dates um, everything in her um, in her journals in yeah. the black journal. Um, this was different. Um, it wasn't with everything, you know, all of her other writings. Um, she didn't sign it, date mm. it, um, the typical stuff. It was even in a different, not a different style of handwriting, but it looked different, if that makes sense. Hmm. So, you know, you have when you write cursive, you have neat, your neat cursive, and then you have your messy cursive where, you know, you're just writing, writing down whatever. Okay. Uh, the, the entry um, on this, in the spiral notebook was very neatly um, scripted. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, yep. Do you, uh, being that it wasn't dated, but being that other things in that same notebook were dated, could you even begin to guess when she wrote that? Um, no, not really. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot in that notebook. Mm -hmm. uh, just took some stuff from school. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't really anything that was dated. Uh, most of the notebook was blank. Except for that. Except for that, yeah. Okay, so, um, and... And uh, since I guess you got to read it, I, I know you don't, maybe you do know it word for word, but did it just say, I'm running off? What, I mean, how, it says three or four sentences, but what did those three or four sentences say? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it has been 11 years. Yeah, and, I, you know, the, sure. Those days when, you know, law enforcement would come to the house were very stressful. Yeah. Um, and I'm that type of person where in stressful situations, you know, my memory is not very good. Okay. But, uh, but you know, uh, me and John both, we don't believe that it was any current mm -hmm. writing of Ellie's. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. It, all right, but this off. was but this was something that was kind of I wouldn't necessarily say found by accident, but this uh, notebook was in a different area than the rest of her journals. But you yes. wouldn't say it was hidden either. No, it wasn't. It wasn't hidden. Uh, okay. It wasn't like under a mattress or you know mm -hmm. <laughs> anything. Okay. It was standing up uh, in between uh, some books and some other, um, you know, like sketch pads and stuff like that. Standing okay. up on the shelf. So, in your opinion, it could have been written in April of 2010. It could have been written in April of 2008. Okay. And the reason I ask this is because recently we covered the disappearance of another teenage girl who did have a diary, but she was keeping one secret from her parents that they didn't find till afterwards. And I don't know how much, I mean, the disappearance is still unsolved, unfortunately, but it did give a window into what was going on in this girl's uh, life at the time. Her name was Leanne Hosberg from New York City. But you uh, uh, did know about Allie's writing these journals, you knew these existed. Yes. Um, mm. She has uh, she started creative uh, writing mm. in elementary school. And it was encouraged by one of her teachers. And, mm. you know, that particular teacher was like, you know, Allie, Allie can tell a great story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I encourage all of our students, you know, to just to write, you know, and okay. it just stuck with Allie, you know, whether it be, uh, a made up story or, you know, it'd be, um, an entry from her life in that day, you know, like mm -hmm. an actual journal. Um, you know, she, she wrote both in there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I guess in through all of these books, I guess we just must take for granted then that even though she wrote all of this stuff in these journals, it necessarily has not been helpful in solving her disappearance. I, I guess, has, I guess. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it, it has hindered wow. um, from law enforcement uh, just because of some of the things that they told me that she wrote in there. Okay. That's a very interesting point you're making there. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. Okay. okay. So in general, so we've covered things going on with Allie. We've gotten to know her a little bit. And in general, in early 2010 to April 26th of 2010, of course, we talked about these boys that she knew her job, her school, these journals, everything else. Everything else. Um, any worries about Allie at all? Any signs that something was going on? 
anything that you look back on now and see it differently? No, actually, in in April and the the couple months leading up to April, mm -hmm. things were going really well, you know, mm -hmm. for our, our entire family, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of the the split up with me and John. Mm -hmm. um, Allie had a hard time with that the year before, mm -hmm. and caused you know a big rift in her relationship with John. Um, so you know, it, it, she you know did some acting out and was angry a lot. And, um, you know, we, uh, started seeing a therapist, you know, mm -hmm. to help her, yeah. you know, cause a lot of, you know, with those emotions and being a teenager and stuff, you know, um, it helps to have professional, you know, guidance basically, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to guide you through and, uh, Allie and John's relationship, um, had actually been mended and hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it was really sad. Okay. Um, so you and your husband had gotten divorced the year before in 2009? No, that's when we split up. Oh, that's uh, when we it, split up. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. We didn't get divorced until I think it was a year after Allie went missing. Okay. All right. Thank you. If you could then now, uh, I'll say that again. What I want to talk about now is something I think is very important uh, given looking at the day of her disappearance, and that is just generally the family pattern. Obviously, at the time in 2010, you and your husband had split. I guess he was living somewhere else by that time in April yes. and of 2010. Yes. All right, so it's you. It's Allie living at the house. Is your son Mason also living there? Yes. All right. So you three are the only three in the house? Yes, living. Uh, uh, my mother actually spent quite a bit of time okay. with us, even though she didn't actually live with us. Okay. I realize it's 11 and a half later, years later, but can you explain? You have a job. Mason's going to school or something. When would everybody like leave the house? When would everybody get home? If, just in general, so we can understand what was the normal thing that went on with everybody on a typical weekday with Allie going to school, et cetera. And then we'll talk about how the grandmother wasn't there that day. But what was usually the usual pattern? You go to, you know, when would you get at home from work, et cetera? Uh -huh. um, uh, on a typical day, um, I would be up getting ready for work. Allie would be getting ready for school. Um, she would leave just before me. Um, and then... Uh, Mason would either uh, have work or school, um, and then my mother would come over uh, before Allie would come home from school. So um, that particular day, mm -hmm. uh, my mom wasn't able to be at the house. Mm -hmm. And I, I must add in there that my mom, her presence at the house became um, more more often. Um, at the end of the semester, uh, at, at the beginning of the year, because mm -hmm. Allie was being bullied. Um, mm -hmm. So she was, she was being bullied on the bus. And <clears throat> there was one instance where um, the, the two girls uh, that were doing the bullying on the bus um, actually hit her um, after she got off the bus. And, you know, Allie would run home and um, mm -hmm. you know, for <laughs> scared for her life, basically, you no. know, because Adley had never uh, been through, you know, any physical type of bullying. So after that instance, um, in a police report and all that good stuff, my mom always made it a point to be here at the house, um, mm -hmm. and standing outside waiting for Allie to get off the bus. Um, what, what I have to ask, being you brought it up, what was going on with these bullying? Who, why was this happening? Who were, I don't mention their names now, but why were these girls doing this? <clears throat> why were these girls doing this? What instigated it? Um, how long had this been going on? Um, it went on for the, for the entire first semester. Um, I think I remember Allie saying that one of the girls accused her of, um, purposely hitting her with the volleyball. Um, 
And I mean, if you've seen a volleyball game in action, I mean, sometimes you can't really control where the ball goes. Sure, of course. Yeah. So, you know, because of the the girls were also of a different race, um, you know, that was also thrown in there. Um, so they not only had gym together, you know, they lived on the next block. So of course they had to ride the, the bus together. So because of uh, the in- instances on the bus, Allie started sitting at the very front mm-hmm. of that. Wow. Yeah. And this is something that continued, <clears throat> something that continued for a long time. Yes. Um, I know that um, Allie got in trouble at school one day because she had uh, this tiny pocket knife that she took to school one day um, after that first fight because Mm -hmm. she was scared. Um, Okay. You know, I asked her about it afterwards. I'm like, why would you take a pocket knife to school? And she said, Mom, these girls are going to hurt me again. So Mm -hmm. I guess she thought that she was going to defend herself with a pocket knife. But she ended yeah. up, you know, getting in trouble and getting it taken away that same day. What had ended up happening to these two other girls? Did they get in trouble at all for this or not? I don't think they did. Okay. We, because um, that day in in uh, in question, the 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 one where they were actually hitting her when they all got off the school bus, um, Allie ran home and called me, and she. She was uh, completely like freaking out because mm-hmm. she thought, you know, these girls are going to kill me and, you know, all this other dramatic talk. And, you know, I told her to hang up and call 911, you know, because she was there in the house by herself. Nobody else was home. Wow. And I left work and I called her dad and told him what was going on. Um, so, and I also called my mom. So everybody else beat me to the house, even including law enforcement, mm-hmm. um, before I got home. So, um, yeah, so when I got home, you know, there, my mom and uh, John and uh, Precinct 4 were all at the house already. Did you ever, and your, uh, I, I realize he wasn't around, you were separated, but did you ever have a chance to talk to these girls' parents about what went on, what was their story, any of that? No, um, we were told not to go and speak to them, um, you know, because mm-hmm. of maybe some uh, altercation that may happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I remember whatever came of it. Um, I think that they were suspended from the bus for a week. I, I think that's what I remember. Okay. Uh, is your opinion that did this bullying continue right up until the day Allie disappeared or did at some point it dissipate? I think it dissipated some because, um, you know, the, the second semester had started mm-hmm. and they didn't put them together anymore. And they, even though they would throw some things at Allie on the bus, she sat at the very front, like the very first seat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was harder for them to actually bully her on the bus man that must have been miserable for her wow as i i felt i felt for Allie because Mm -hmm. i was bullied in school but i was fortunate enough where i didn't have to ride a bus and deal with it as well so Mm -hmm. okay and these, uh, you're saying it's on the same bus, so they, like you said, they, these girls lived on the very next block. Did you even know anything about them before this all started? Did you know the families, the mm-hmm. girls, anything? No, I didn't even know no. that these girls existed. Um, okay. uh, I guess they hung out with a completely different crowd in the neighborhood than Allie. Okay. Because at the time, there was, you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of high school kids in mm-hmm. our neighborhood, and I, I never saw these girls before. And none of these other kids on this bus, riding the bus, uh, came to Allie's defense at all? No. No. Even though, once again, they're on the same bus, though they all kind of live in the same area, none of them, mm-hmm. none of them did that. No. Nope. As a matter of fact, um, that the main day that um, the girl, those two girls got off the bus with Allie, uh, all the kids got off the bus in the 
the bus driver is not supposed to allow that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Please explain that again. Maybe, maybe again, they all got off the bus. You're going to have to maybe explain that a little bit. So, uh, so Allie got off the bus that day and mm. the two bullies, um, also followed Allie off of the bus and, um, on the day she disappeared. No, no, no. Oh, oh, no. oh, okay. You're just going to have to be specific on what day it was, please. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, sorry. All, right. No, That's it, all right. No, it's all right. It was the day that, um, you know, Allie, uh, I guess the, the big fight or whatever. Oh, okay. Called. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the day she called 911 was the day they got off the bus with her. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Just wanted to make clear on that. Okay. So she had this issue, um, but was this happening at school too? It seemed like it started school, but was it only on the bus or was this happening at school? What did her friends say about it? Um, I don't, I don't know what her friends um, had to say about it because uh, it had dissipated by the time Allie went missing. Because okay. you know the first part of the school year is when they had gym together, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, it was you know towards the end of that semester mm-hmm. uh, when the incident with the bullies happened mm-hmm. um, on the bus. So um, it had slowly, uh, you know, that we thought mm-hmm. we, it had slowly kind of just gone away because Allie started riding at the front of the bus. Okay. But on that day that she disappeared riding on the bus, those two girls were on the bus too. Um, we did actually look at that and they were not on the bus. Huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for explaining all of that. Let's uh, now maybe talk about the grandmother. I don't know if we necessarily need to get into why your mother, uh, Allie's grandmother, was not there that particular day on the day of the disappearance. But did Allie know that her grandmother was not going to be there that day when she got home? Was it something that was pre- pre-known? She knew that afternoon. Um mm. Because I think it was that morning uh, when my mom told me that she was going to go have lunch with her girlfriends in Pasadena. Um, so, you know, that's whenever, you know, I let the kids know that, mm-hmm. you know, grandma's not going to be there this afternoon. And then um, that's when Allie said, well, I forgot my key again. And that's when I got in touch with Mason. And I said, you know, Mason, if you leave, can you leave the door unlocked for your sister? So... It was, you know, set where Allie knew she could come into the house. Okay. Um, so you just felt comfortable leaving the door unlocked in the, in that neighborhood. Sounds like that like, mm-hmm. gives me the impression that it's you considered it to be a safe neighborhood. Absolutely. Back then, okay. yes. <laughs> okay. All right. And later, after Allie went missing, did you find her key in the house that she had really forgotten it? Um. Think so. Um, I'm trying to think back. I mm-hmm. I think we did, and you know it's funny um, that I have a random key with a, with a twist tie on the end of it that I could never figure out what it went to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we've had uh, there was one hurricane that we had that damaged the front door, so we've had wow. you know uh, yeah. a couple of different. Uh, door locks, you know, within these last 11 years. Um, okay. Yeah. But off the top of your head, she said she forgot her key, but you don't specifically remember after she went missing, going through her things and actually finding her key. Right. right. Okay. But it, was, it wasn't untypical of her to forget her key. Okay. All right. She's a teenager. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's move to that day. Um, just a regular day, at least as far as you've told me. You go to work, she goes to school, and then on the way home, she, I guess, texts you about the burger barn. Please explain that. Um, so she had called, and um, at first she had asked if she could stay after school to work on some paper. Um, and then, uh, you know, I asked, well, how are you going to get home? And she said that, um, you know, either I could pick her up or uh, one of her friends would give her a ride home. That was, uh, it was kind of unclear um, because shortly after that um, is when she started uh, asking if she could go pick up her paycheck at work. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know exactly what happened with, you know, the, the 
the schoolwork, but, um, okay. Uh, but on. she, I <laughs> all right, that's fine. I'll, I'll put you back on track. So she's on the bus and she's asking you if she can walk down to the burger barn and you were very hesitant to allow her to do that. Right, right. So it, it started um, before she had got on the school bus. It was um, probably sometime after her lunch hour. And, um, you know, she, you know, trying to make plans for when she gets home. And, you know, so she wanted to go pick up her check and see if she could work as well. So, so typically, you know, as I stated earlier, that she would have to call them to see if she could work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when she got home from school, if she was able to work, then her grandmother would normally take her and drop her off. And then I would pick her up that evening. So, um, you know, with her grandmother not being home that day, she begged and begged and begged me to walk up to work. And, you know, after me telling her no several times, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, kids just really know how to, you know, Uh you into saying yes. yes. So she's like, you know, I'll, I'll text you when I get there. I'm not going anywhere else. I'll be careful. You know, all of the, the safety. Mm-hmm. Safety, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so I gave in and I told her, okay. And, you know, I told her, I said, text me when you get there, you know, let me know if you're going to work. Um, and, you know, after after the conversation of me giving in, I never heard from her again. Okay. Uh, something I think maybe myself and the listeners need to understand. The way you understand her riding the bus home from school. Mm-hmm. Would the bus... Granted, Burger Barn is not that far from your house. And in fact, I'll be doing a YouTube video so everybody can understand these locations. Would the bus have gone by the Burger Barn on the way to your house that day? No. No. All right, so most, so in your opinion, the most efficient way for her to get to the burger barn would have been to just get off where she usually got off and then walk to the burger barn. Correct. In contrast to the burger barns, you know, the bus is going right by the burger barn and maybe there's a stop that was closer that she could have gotten off then. Yeah, but this is a school bus, so Mm -hmm. uh, most of the school buses, they drop kids off inside the neighborhoods. Okay. All right, so there's no way that um, she could have gotten off the bus earlier to go to the Burger Barn. It it was just she was going to have to get off at her regular stop and then walk Mm -hmm. to the Burger Barn. That was the only way it was going to happen. Right. All right, and your understanding was that she was going to walk down there, which is not very far, and then come directly home. Yes, That was. she did. If she didn't have to work. Correct. Okay. All right. And so this is the last time um, you heard from her after giving her permission to walk to the burger barn. And we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. So you get home, I, I guess, later that day. Maybe your son gets home first. I know there was a... Uh, when we spoke before, you were a little unclear. Did you get home first? Did your son... Was your son there first? But just in general, when you or he get home and she's not there, what do you think? What do you do? Um, well, I assumed that she was at the burger <clears throat> barn. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you got to keep in mind that she had never walked to work before. Yeah. So, But, I mean, it's only like a 10-minute walk. It's less than a quarter of a mile. So even if she did go up there, pick up a paycheck, and then walk back home, uh, you know, that was two hours, two and a half hours she would have had, you know, mm-hmm. to walk up there and walk back. Um, so with her not being home and her brother not seeing her, then, you know, that led me to believe that she had worked. Okay. Did you think about the idea that maybe she really did, uh, you know, go there, then come home and maybe go to somebody else's house or something? Was that No. No. Okay. Were there any signs that you saw in your house, once again, I realize it's 11 and a half years later, that she was in the house at all? No. Okay. All right. So, of course, the, then the evening gets into the evening. You still have not heard from her. Did you call the burger barn? Did you try calling her? When did you start getting a little, uh, of course, uh, nervous about all this? Well, when when I got home... Um, you 
know, I'm a little perturbed that she wasn't, she, that she was not home. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, cause I told her, you know, I said, text me and let me know if you're going to work or not. Um, and she didn't text me at all. And I got home and she wasn't home. So I had assumed that mm-hmm. she was at the burger bar. Sure. So I sent her a text and, you know, let her know, you know, I said, let me know when you get off so I can come and pick you up. Um, and I never heard back from her. Mm-hmm. So I think an hour went by. I texted her again. Um, and then it was 830. Mm-hmm. Uh, 830, you know, that's whenever I started really, yeah. uh, thinking. you know, I already had that, you know, gut feeling that something was going on. But, um, you know, I was trying not to be that overreactive mom. Sure. And, uh, so it was, I think it was, uh, shortly after eight 30, it was before nine o'clock that I just, I'm like, well, she's not going to text me back. I'm just going to go up there and tell her what's what, you know? Sure. And, um, when I pull up in the front of the burger bar and the lights are off and the chairs are on the tables, nobody was there. It was closed. It was closed. And, and, uh, my, and my understanding is that they usually would still have been open at that time. But so they, they, o'clock. they closed early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at that point, uh, what did you do? Did you have like a contact number for like the, uh, the owner or her boss or supervisor at the burger barn? Anything like uh, that? Or, you know, wh- who did you start calling and texting next besides Allie? Um, well, I did try to, to reach Allie's phone a couple mm-hmm. of times. Um, and then that's when I really started to freak out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right. I did not have her manager's contact information and, mm. uh, I feel really bad that I didn't think to mm. get that, you know, yeah. when she first started working there. Yeah. Um, you know, the things we know now. <laughs> sure. Uh, absolutely. Every disappearance the same way. A lot of things you look back hindsight 2020. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Right. Sure. So, um, my first instinct was to call John and, uh, you know, let him know what was going on. And, you know, he's always been my, my voice of reason, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, and, you know, he, he called me down. He's like, well, she's probably with a friend, you know, she's got to be somewhere, you know? So we kind of went through a mental checklist of, you know, places she could be. Mm-hmm. Um, which was very odd because nothing ever like this had happened yeah, before. Right. So, um, after I put myself together, I was still sitting in the parking lot and, uh, uh I headed to her boyfriend's house, DJ. And, uh, his mom answered the phone, uh, answered the door. And when I came in and was talking to him, he had also expressed that he had been trying to get a hold of Allie. Wow. Um, and, you know, that's, that's when <laughs> uh, everything just right. spiraled in my mind. Right. Right. Did he offer up any, uh, did, uh, you know, what with his parents though, but did DJ offer up any opinion on what he thought could be going on? I mean, he, you know, he would be, have been seeing that part of Allie, maybe that you, uh, and your husband, her father, uh, weren't seeing, could he ever, did he offer up an opinion on where she could be at that point when... You know, what was he thinking? No, he, he didn't have a clue um, as to, you know, what to do or what she, where she might be or anything like that. Okay. Uh, did he say anything about how she talked about staying after school to work on a paper? No. Okay. So what did you do next? I'm guessing the police got called at this point. Uh, was it then? that evening, that night that you got them involved or what did you do? Um, well, after, uh, John got off work, um, he came home and, um, you know, we, the three of us and me, John and Mason, uh, were trying to, to figure out what to do and where to go and where, mm-hmm. where to look basically. Uh, Mason and his friends, um, got together and went and drove around, uh, the near area subdivisions to see if she was, walking with friends or wherever mm-hmm. um me and john did the same thing and went by a couple of a, friend, a few friends house 
you know, that we knew uh, where they lived. Um, and it wasn't until just before midnight that night when we all got home with nothing, you know, we decided to call um, Precinct 4 and, mm -hmm. you know, ask for help, basically. Okay. In your calling, driving by, finding friends and everything, did anybody... I, obviously, they didn't see her, but did any of them give an opinion on where she might be, um, where she could have gone? No. None. No, absolutely nothing from anybody. Okay. And in the process, just to cover all the bases here regarding this, in the process of doing this, of course you spoke to DJ, but did you think of going and talking to Aaron? Did you think of going and talking or calling uh, Jay, being that you knew these were two of Allie's friends? Um, and that specifically that night. No, not that night. Okay. Um, yeah, I I don't remember if I I don't remember if we went by Jay's house that night or not because um, I didn't mm -hmm. know where he lived. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, Aaron didn't cross my mind because Allie really wasn't fond of him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking to myself, why would why would she be over okay. there? You know, sure. Okay. But, you know, Allie was, you know, she, I mean, to us, to her family, she wasn't um, manipulative. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, she she never wasn't where she said she would be. Mm hmm So, you know, that night, I mean, we had no reason to think anything different. Right. You know, and Right, and I, and I, so, if I could jump in here, we have to also remember something. You were still under the belief that she really did go to the burger barn that day. Yeah. Right, we have to remember that. So, of course, we find out later that that was not the situation. But you were doing all this believing that she actually made it to the burger barn and maybe worked there and then left, maybe. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. All right, so um, so the police get involved. Uh, you know, we move in uh, to the next day. Uh, what do they do? Uh, do they try to track down you know, kids that would have been on the bus. What is the information regarding uh, her getting off the bus that day? My understanding is other students did get off the bus with her that day. Um, yes, and we had to find that out for ourselves. Um, oh, wow. uh, when law enforcement came out that same night, um, you know, they basically accused her of being a runaway or mm -hmm. just staying out late. Um, she had even mentioned, oh, well, maybe, maybe y'all had a fight and she's just cooling off with a friend. Um, and she didn't even take a report that same night. So the next day, um, you know, I called John, I stayed home from work, um, you know, waiting for mm -hmm. Allie to walk through that door and, um, she never did walk through that door. Yeah. So I called John, and uh, you know we were trying to think of what what we need to do now. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. What did uh, what did being that you had to do this uh, on your own? What did these other kids say? Who and and I'm I'm guessing uh, these were not these two bullies. These were other kids. Do you believe them? And what did they say? The ones that usually get off the stop with Allie. What did they say? Um, well, once we did find out that Allie did actually ride the bus home, mm -hmm. um, the other boys. There were two boys that got off um, that live uh, a couple of houses past ours, mm -hmm. and um, they said that um, yeah, Allie rode the bus home that day. And instead of her, you know, walking down the street with them, um, she went to uh, the corner, which is, um, not, you know, just because, we, well, you know, the bus let, lets off at the corner. So instead of walking in front of the bus to come to the house, um, she went to the corner, uh, stood there for a minute and sent a text message and then turned to walk out of the neighborhood. If you could describe as well as you can. What intersection would the bus, where did the bus stop? On what street, what like intersection or what? Maybe that might help us uh, in this. Sure. So um, 
our subdivision, there's one main uh, circle street, um, and ours is like a cross street. And mm-hmm. the bus lets off uh, at uh, Naughty Post. So Naughty Post is the main street that goes all the way around in mm-hmm. a circle. And then it's it stops, you know, at every cross street. So the bus literally let off um, at the T where our street hits Naughty Post. Mm-hmm. So uh, in looking at a map, it's your house is like three yards away. Mm-hmm. It's like two yes. houses, it's like your house, another house, another house, then the intersection. Correct. All right, so that close. So she got off the bus right there. Yep. Okay. And so when these kids saw her texting, and we're going to, there's, I think there's an eyewitness to this as well that backs this up. Um, when they saw her texting, where was she standing? Right there at that same intersection, or did she walk down the street a little bit? Um, she was uh, standing at the stop sign. So mm-hmm. the, where she was standing was um, the door of the bus. Um, if you think of, of logistics, so, Mm -hmm. um, the bus would have come in and gone counterclockwise. Okay. So the door of the bus where the kids let get out is facing away from my house. Yes. Gotcha. So, so the two boys, yeah. So the two boys walk in front of the bus Mm -hmm. and come around to come home. Yeah. Um, at box. The, uh, up to the, the sidewalk and to the stop sign, which it lets out right there. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, naughty post and old pike. Okay. And, so, and that's where they last saw her. Yes. Okay. And that would have been, though, in the direction of the burger barn. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's what these kids say. Uh, and of course they said they did not see anything, of course, suspicious or anything else. It was just a normal day, normal day to them. Correct. Okay. Now, when did you find out that she did not show up at the burger barn? Even though she said she was walking there, uh, it seems she never made it there for whatever reason. When did you find that out? Uh, we didn't find out until, uh, the next afternoon. Um, John had gone up there to talk to uh, the owner of the burger barn mm-hmm. and, you know, to see if he had any surveillance footage. And they, they, they're only on 24-hour loop. Right. Okay, but she never showed up there, did not. And did she have a check there waiting for her? They said she did, yes. Did you ever see that check? Did they ever give it to you? No, there was nothing. All right. So... She said she was going to pick up a check, but the way you remember it, the the check, which, you know, you're her custodian, you're her parent, they could certainly trust you uh, with it. They never gave that check to you or your husband, to your knowledge. Correct. Okay. All right, so she never end, did end up in the burger barn, and like you said, and I'll show in a map, that um, this is very short distance, like you said, like a quarter mile. Okay. Uh, what kind of news coverage um, did Allie's disappearance get? Was it right away? Was there a lot of coverage on it? A lot of people found out very quickly that she was missing? No. Um, and it was, uh, we didn't get any coverage. So what was going on in April 2010 was the, the big oil spill out in the Gulf. Oh. Um, so that hindered. Um, any news coverage plus law enforcement was calling her a runaway and mm-hmm. I mean the news does, they don't cover runaway stories usually not that is true yeah. okay so not a lot of news coverage so not a lot of people even knew to be looking for her just you and a few people mm-hmm. um You've, of course, we've talked about uh, her male friends what about her girlfriends uh, any of them any help when you started questioning them about, yeah, she texted me she was going to walk to work, but she never made it there. Did they, any of them have any opinions on this? At that time, no. None of them had any uh, insight as to, you know, if they knew anything. All okay. of them, you know, didn't have any information to offer. Okay. Now, we have to re- keep in mind, not only is Allie missing, but what items are, are missing? We know the key... Uh, that she says she didn't have um, is not missing, uh, seemingly. 
Uh, uh-huh. But what else is missing? Her possessions, what else are missing? Um, just what she had on her that day. She had mm-hmm. on her jacket, her cell phone, her school ID, and her backpack. Okay. And those items yeah. have never been found 11 and a half years later. Correct. Okay. All right, so the police think it's a a runaway and think she is a runaway. This is a runaway case. You, of course, think differently. Um, Even though, um, you know, we did talk about later, you did find out about how she had written about that, written about that, but there's no, you know, a lot of kids have probably written that, and we don't know when it was written. Uh, It doesn't seem like the kids on the bus are very helpful, but they did say, yeah, she was standing... Uh, at this stop sign, and she was using her phone. So let's move right into that. Uh, I know that you did get access to her phone records. Did you check them right away? Who was the last person Ellie talked to? Who could she have been texting at that stop sign? Um, we didn't check it right away. I mean, it was just something that you don't think of. Um, uh, uh, I think it was two days afterward. Um, so the only advice that we were giving to do things ourselves by was by the Laura Recovery Center. Uh, um, <clears throat> so they're the ones that actually were helping us, not law enforcement. Okay. And uh, you know they kind of gave me a checklist of things to start doing, and uh, and I'm like, oh my god, why didn't I think about you know checking uh, my phone account? my mm-hmm. cell phone account to, to see, you know, what I could see. Um, and then that's when, you know, I, I printed off the whole month of, uh, April, you know, for phone mm-hmm. calls and text messages yeah. and stuff. So, um, they don't, we have at and and they don't back up what the text messages contain. Sure. Um, they, what we did have was the dates and the times, okay. um, and, uh, and the phone numbers. Um, so me and, uh, my mother-in-law and, uh, and somebody else, I can't remember. Um, we all split everything up. Uh, it, and it was, it was a hundred pages. It had to be a hundred pages mm-hmm. of, um, text messages. Okay. So we were going through, going through and sifting through, you know, phone numbers and at first we were just looking at that day um, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's um, text messages from Jay and uh, DJ and a couple of numbers that we didn't know. Um, so we were told to, you know, call those numbers and find out who they belong to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were a couple of questionable numbers on there. One of them was a Las Vegas number. Um so when we called it, we were told that it was one of her friend's mom's phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, so we identified all of the phone phone numbers okay. and text messages and stuff. And the last person that she had contact with was Jay. Do you believe, being if we are to believe, and I think there's a witness to back this up, she's standing there at that stop sign seemingly going to the burger barn after she gets off the bus. It is, is it your belief, looking at the records, that the mm-hmm. person she was texting while standing at the stop sign was Jay? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else, how many times would you say that she uh, texted or talked to him that day? Do you remember? Oh, uh, I don't remember from that specific day i know mm. it was a a couple of back and forth text messages and mm. when we questioned uh when john questioned a uh, jay yeah about we're, it, we're gonna we'll get to that we'll get to that that's that's fine i just want to make okay. sure that right now though um that the once again before seemingly something happened to her phone maybe she shut it off maybe somebody else shut it off who knows but the last communications were with jay yes okay as far as ping information, do you have any idea of where her phone last pinged? Like, what, uh, tower, what tower did it last bounce off of? Yeah, the, it, it, our tower. There's one right at the um, end of our subdivision. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So that's uh, where that happened. And then we know that this text, maybe those two things uh, are the same. Uh, that phone mm -hmm. account, did you leave it active? Did you continue yes, to I'm pay the bail, bill? Yes, I'm uh, still paying on you, it. Yeah. You still. Anything strange go on with it over the last 11 years? Anything people trying to connect with her? I, I, I'm guessing not 11 and a half years later, but at the time after she went missing, any texts or phone calls that her phone got that you thought were strange? Um, no. And, and there's a little bit of a story on that. So, um, you know, when a phone is turned off and you know, there's, there's not going to be anything that comes across the records. Yeah. Um, so me and my private investigator, Amber, um, we took the phone number that I have for Allie and we put it on a new phone. So okay. we actually access to Allie's mm -hmm. phone number. Okay. Yeah. All right. And anything weird happen? Um, we, well, we got, you know, phone calls, but it was all like junk. Um, and spam stuff. Spam, scam, yeah, spam, scam calls. likely calls. Yes. 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 So, um, but it was just, it was just strange, you know, hearing that phone ring. But um, yeah. we, with that phone number, though, we were able to log in to, um, to recover Allie's Facebook page mm -hmm. and her Yahoo email. Okay, and we're gonna get, and we're gonna get back to that. Okay, very good. Uh, I talked about this witness besides the students who were with her who went one direction, she went the other. There is another witness who claims uh, she was in her car driving through the neighborhood and saw Allie standing there. Yeah, so there was um, an older girl uh, that she was able to drive back and forth to high school. And she told us that when she pulled up in her driveway, she saw Allie mm. standing at the corner texting. Okay, so this backs up what the students said. Yes. Okay, and did you get to speak to this uh, um, woman one-on-one? -on -one? I did not, no. Okay, who spoke to her in, in regards to that conversation? Uh, I believe it was John. Um, okay. You know, it was, I know we had organized uh, a door-to-door -door, uh, mm -hmm. canvas um, to, to ask anybody if they saw anything. Do you believe, as far as people you trust, that the last sighting of Allie is at that stop sign? Nobody has ever come forward saying, well, I saw her walking toward the burger barn. I saw her walking out on the main street. Has anybody ever said that in the last 11 years? Uh, not credible, um, okay. or I should say not anyone that knows Allie personally. Mm -hmm. So when, when a person goes missing, you're going to get all kinds of people saying, oh, I think I saw you know, this, or I think I saw that. So we had a couple of people come forward saying that she was walking on Cypress Wood going back towards the high school in that direction. Um, and somebody in a, a green truck had stopped, stopped her and was talking to her. Um, and then we had um, uh, people say that, oh, well, she ran away with her boyfriend. So, yeah, except for uh, the fact that no boy boys are missing, right? Right. Okay. All right. So yes, that often happens. Um, people saying things that that aren't necessarily true. Okay. But right. you personally believe though this woman who says she saw uh, Allie standing at the stop sign there. Yes. Okay. Now let's get back to something you uh, brought up before. Uh, we're, we were going to get into, but I just wanted to cover those other things first. It's Jay. He is the last person uh, that Allie texted with. We had talked about him earlier in this conversation. He was in her grade, but maybe was a year older. He had a car, did not live close to uh, where you lived. But he was the last person that com communicated with Jay. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Allie's father, your ex-husband, went over there to talk to him. And what happened? Um... Well, the way it was described to me was that um, Jay's father uh, was not very cooperative, uh, not very nice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when he was questioned about the content of the text messages, um, he said that Allie was uh, seeing what he was doing after school and if he wanted to come over. 
And what did he say in response to that? Being that she wanted him to come over, what was his response to that? Is he saying that he said no? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and that was that. Do you know if the police ever talked to Jay about these conversations? I believe they did. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we didn't, we don't get a lot of feedback of what the mm-hmm. law enforcement did. Okay. Did Jay, to your knowledge, either that day when your ex-husband, Ali's father went over there to speak to him or any day since, has Jay ever offered up his own theory as to what happened to Ali being that he texted with her the very day, like within, I guess, minutes of her disappearance. No. Has he ever said, well, I think that she got kidnapped. I think that she ran off. I think that this happened. I think that that happened. He's never offered up anything. He has never offered anything. He hasn't reached out to us. Nothing. Okay. Is his story that uh, Jay never saw Allie that day? Uh, Maybe they saw each other in school, but is he saying that he never saw her after school? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, so she wants him to come over. He doesn't want to do so. But And we believe, do you believe that, if we're to believe that conversation, I'm not sure if we should or not, but he is admitting he got these texts and you believe that it was her standing at the stop sign. That's who she was communicating with. Yes. With Jay. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to DJ. We, he is like the official boyfriend, uh, the guy you liked. He'd been over to your house a few times. What did he have to say about all of this? Was he helpful Um, did he have any comment being that his girlfriend was texting with another guy? Uh, what can you say about DJ's reaction to all of this? Um, I know his, his reaction was concern. Um, he, what he showed up at the, cause he was, he had a skateboard. So he kind of was able, you know, to get Mm -hmm. around kind of like bicycles. Yeah. Yeah. Came up to the search searches a couple of times. Um, and spent some time with me and <sighs> offered to help, even though mm-hmm. he wasn't, you know, old enough to yeah. do any services or anything. But, um, you know, I, I could physically, I could see that he was physically worried. Mm-hmm. So you, uh, let's just put it this way, you have uh, no suspicions that he had anything to do with Allie's disappearance? No. Okay. Um, Did he ever offer up uh, his own theory as to what could have happened? If you you don't feel comfortable talking for him, that's totally fine, but if you just want to answer yes or no, has he ever offered up his own theory as to what could have happened to Allie? No, um, no, I think he was kind of like me and John, you know, we just don't, we don't know what's going on or what could have happened. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and do you think, uh, that the police talked to him at all? Once again, I realize that, uh, it doesn't seem like you've got a lot of police help on this, but have they spoken to him? I think they did eventually. Mm-hmm. I think. Because when we would ask law enforcement, once they did take us seriously, um, when we would ask them, you know, mm-hmm. did you do this? Did you do that? You know, so that we knew what we were going to do as well, um, they wouldn't give us any information. You know, we're like, mm-hmm. well, can you give us a list of people you've talked to? And they said, no, but if you ask us specific specifically, then we'll tell you yes or no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep, yeah, that's how police are. I know, they treat me the same way, Joanne. So I know how that feels. Uh, I, I I know it very well, and it's they're like that all over the United States, just not in Texas. Okay, so the boyfriend uh, DJ offers to help. He doesn't have a car. Doesn't live in the area. Hard to understand how he and Allie maybe could have run into each other after she got off the bus that day. That brings us to Aaron. Maybe I should ask you this. Jay, DJ, and Aaron, did they know each other? Were they friends? Um, I don't think they were friends. Um, they may have known each other through school. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't, I don't think that they would call each other friends. It just Mm -hmm. seemed like something that made sense at the time. Okay. Would you say that they were three guys that probably ran in three different circles? 
Yes. Different cliques or groups or whatever else you want to call them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now let's talk about Aaron. He, of course, is the one who lived right there. Uh, was he any help? Was he on, uh, maybe I should ask you this, because this is kind of a conflicting story. Was he on the bus that day? <clears throat> <laughs> that is a conflicting story, yes. Um, so, according to him, he was on the bus that day. Uh, but according to the bus surveillance, he was not on the bus that day. Any explanation for that? Anything that he's ever been able to give to you or anybody else as to why it'd be pretty easy to remember. I realize sometimes days one goes into the next, but this was a you know a day that could have been important in his life, being that a girl that he liked goes missing and he gets it wrong, or mm -hmm. he can't he not gets it wrong, but um, his story just doesn't quite match up with the facts. Right. So, so one thing you have to, to think about was, um, you know, law enforcement, private investigators, you know, mm -hmm. uh, me and John doing our own, uh, investigating ourselves. So, um, when we started having Amber involved, um, Amber contacted all of Allie's friends, mm -hmm. every single one of them. And she didn't come into the picture until maybe two years after Allie went missing. So um, Allie's friends were either graduating mm -hmm. or just graduated. They're out of school. They're a little bit older, a little bit wiser. And um, when she speaks to Aaron, um, Aaron tells her that, yes, um, Allie was having phone problems that day on the bus. I helped mm -hmm. her with her phone. Um, and mm -hmm. which made me, you know, shake my head in disbelief. I'm like, why would he say that? He wasn't on the bus, you know, because we yeah. have picture, you know, of the kids on the bus and John reviewed the, mm -hmm. the surveillance himself and Aaron was not on the bus that day. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, he proceeds to tell Amber, you know, this uh, long story about how Allie was having problems with her phone not working um, while they were on their bus ride home. And, you know, he was trying to help her fix her phone. Is that news to you? Did you ever hear of Allie ever having any problems with her phone? No, okay. none whatsoever. <clears throat> Okay, uh, is it possible that she did have a problem, but it could have been on a different day? Given that, given that he was being asked about this a couple years later. It's possible, <coughs> uh, but she never mentioned having any issues with her phone to me. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have her phone records and, you know, hundreds of calls, thousands of texts. It seems like her phone was working just fine. Oh, yes. Okay. Definitely. All right. Uh, maybe a little too well. Okay. Yes. Okay. So not sure what to make that make of that. All we know is a couple years after the fact, his story did not match up with what was went on on April 26th, 2010. Correct. Okay. Now, the way you remember it back in April of uh, 2010, was he helpful? You know, at the time, did he seem concerned about Allie's disappearance? Did he come over to your house? Did you talk to him? Did you talk to his parents about Allie's disappearance? Um, I, I didn't talk to his parents. He did come and knock at the door once um, and ask, you know, uh, if we'd heard from her or anything like that. Um, you know, of course, the answer was no. Uh, okay. But as far as I know, that was the only time that uh, he'd ever been over to ask about her. Okay. Um... These three guys, do you happen to know what they've done with their lives? Of course, you know, these are just three people that were in her circle. I'm not necessarily pointing fingers at them, but being that they were people who had communications with Allie, what have they done with their lives since 2010? Any of them have criminal records, anything like that? Um, well, I have no idea about Jay. Mm -hmm. uh, we never heard from him uh, since then. Okay. DJ, um, friends with his mom and him on Facebook, and he mm -hmm. went on to college and graduated. Um, uh, Aaron, I think he quit school. Mm. Um, he was into 
drugs. I don't know about a criminal record. Okay. Um, I do know that his dad is a Houston police officer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he went to some type of uh, workforce camp or something. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where you, you go off and it's kind of like a boot camp and you learn a trade, I think. Okay. Uh, not absolutely sure. Okay. Um, but currently, I, I have no idea what he's doing. Okay. Let's move on to this. You've mentioned her a couple times now in the last few minutes, and I do want to talk about her because, of course, in the Disappeared episode, she was interviewed, and she uh, worked with you uh, for quite a while regarding Allie's disappearance, although my understanding is that um, she is kind of um, taking a step back right at this point. But how did Amber get involved, Amber Kamek, get involved in Allie's disappearance? Um, well, Amber, I had met her, um, her mother-in-law at the time was a co-worker of mine. And, um, Amber was a stay-at-home mom with three kids and, you know, just had a computer, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, she had, uh, helped on some, you know, true crime stuff, you know, just by doing computer stuff previously. So with, um, her knowing Allie through her mother-in-law, uh, she wanted to help where she could. And, um, you know, she started doing some, I think they call it sleuthing. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, she yeah. started doing some of it herself and, um, you know, got in touch with me and asked if she could help. Um, so, you know, at the time we had, uh, a private investigator, uh, and I told her, I said, well, how about you call him and, you mm-hmm. know, see, give him the information that you found and maybe, you know, you can help him. Um, so that's how it started. She started helping our, uh, the private investigator that we had. Um, and she ended up getting her private investigation license herself mm-hmm. and, um, you know, basically becoming, you know, private investigator and helping. Okay. Uh, so that's how she came about. Okay. Now I want to, I know she's done a lot, but I want to sp- stick to um, some specific uh, points here regarding her work. First of all, um, this these emails that came, uh, seemingly came from Las Vegas, she found them in Allie's account. Of course, we now know that um, maybe a friend of her, uh, a mother, uh, uh, the mother of a friend of Allie's maybe lived in Las Vegas or had a Las Vegas phone number. I have a Las Vegas phone number. What can you tell uh, the listeners about that? Amber filing, uh, finding these Las Vegas emails. And what did they say? Okay, so so it goes back to us um, and Allie's phone number. So mm-hmm. we were able to do the, you know, uh, forgotten password type of deal. Yeah and uh, get into Allie's email that way. So there were, um, there was one email uh, in there. I think it was in the delete file or the trash or something like that. Um, but it was empty. It was an, empty, there was no content in the mm-hmm. email. Um, so Amber was able to track the IP address back mm-hmm. to Las Vegas. That's how, you know, she knew that it was from Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, but as, as far as, you know, finding out exactly who it was from, that's what we don't know. What was, do you remember what the email address was? I Did, don't. Uh, that's fine. Did you, um, what, I guess in the email, I guess there wasn't an, an address there. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what it looked like. I would like to know. <laughs> okay. Well, it would be interesting to know what the email address was. I mean, it could have just been a spammy email or it could have been something more considerable. Uh, if yeah. you knew what the actual email address is, at least now in 2021, you can track email addresses. All right. So maybe there's something there. And was this e- were these emails sent like before Allie went missing or after she went missing? After. After. Okay. Mm-hmm. But those are the only ones that kind of stuck out to you? This one's from Las Vegas. Those are the ones, uh, the one or a few that seemed to be out of place. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to this. And this uh, took up uh, a portion of the disappeared episode on Allie's disappearance. Uh, this investigation that took everybody to Ohio. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? 
so that happened. Um, it it started with uh, a t- that came in from uh, a lady that had said that she saw Allie at a um, a church function. It was um, a community outreach function where they did haircuts and uh, mm. you know manicures and stuff for the needy and homeless people. Um, and she's just she called me on my house phone number, which was strange. She was able to look me up on the internet, and mm-hmm. uh, she was explaining to me how she said that she saw Allie, and uh, so that's what started that investigation. And in then, Ohio, she saw her in Ohio. Mm-hmm, what city mm-hmm. in Ohio? Uh, Columbus. Columbus, Ohio. Okay, uh, yeah. Unfound has been there a couple times. Okay, and so okay. that kind of got everything started. Yes. Yeah. To the point that Amber. And I guess got involved in law enforcement and she was doing like, I don't know what to call it, undercover work going in there or something, something like yeah. that. So, so once we started uh, digging around and we had actually visited there, spoke to local uh, law enforcement and Amber spoke to uh, some homeless people um, and started showing Allie's photo around, there were several people that recognized her photo. Um so that's that's what started that whole investigation is the other people mm-hmm. there saying that they had seen Allie. Okay. And once um, they went up there looking around and everything, was there any facts to support the idea that Allie was ever there? No facts, no. Mm-hmm. Just sightings of Allie or someone who looked like Allie? Correct. Okay. Um, and so, what you, and, it comes down to please. there, there was a girl there and was being called Allie. Huh. Uh, but it was, once we did actually get a photo of that girl, it was not Allie. Okay. My Allie. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that this woman who said this, was she wrong? We know many times people infuse themselves into disappearances. Was this just a person making a mistake? Uh, or do you think that there was something to that? Um, well, when we got a photo uh, of the girl that everyone was calling, um, I I sent it over to the lady that it initially called in the tip, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Yes, that's the girl that I saw." So you know, mm-hmm. we were you know, she's like, "I'm so sorry, you know, that I caused you all of this pain, you know, because it's not your daughter." Mm-hmm. So um, so that you know. That lead, you know, we were able to cross off of our list. Okay. Um, you know, but there were other some other things that it also led us to Ohio. So. Okay. Yeah. Is it, of course this would be under the belief that Ali um, got sex trafficked. Um, is there any proof that any people connected to Ali were involved in sex trafficking? Whether it was Aaron, DJ, Jay. Anybody else that you found on her text messages, on the phone calls, anybody there that you could connect to anything regarding sex trafficking or sex trafficking charges? Well, at, at the time that we were doing the disappeared episode, we were still putting together um, other information. Mm-hmm. And, and um, it was uh, information we were working on from Aaron's older brother. Um, so Aaron's older brother had actually lived in Columbus. Um, I think I was told that they have a grandmother that lives there as well. Um, and, and then other things that lead us to believe this information is that there was another girl from spring a couple of years after Allie went missing. Um, she went missing and Amber was able to discover um, Facebook messages between her and Aaron. Um, and he was seemingly uh, grooming her. So, wow. um, you know, giving her drugs and, you know, all the, the sweet talk, you know, mm-hmm. oh, your parents, you know, they don't appreciate you. They don't love you and blah, blah, blah. So, mm-hmm. so there is so, something there. Was uh, that certainly sounds considerable to me? Was Aaron ever charged with anything? <clears throat> not to my knowledge. All right, and you also brought up his brother. Uh, his older brother uh, could have been involved in something like this too. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. And they had a connection to Columbus where this woman says she saw Allie. Yes. All right. And we have to remember you're in Texas. So mm-hmm. there may be some sort of synergy there. Maybe. Right. And mm-hmm. that's what also led you to go, uh, the investigation to go to Ohio. I have to ask about this other girl. So she was found alive. Yes. Yes. So Amber okay. was able to uh, to track her down and figure out where she was. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was in Austin. Um, and I can actually... Um, when we're done speaking, I can send you, uh, I'll have to find it. I send you a link to a news interview that she did. Okay. Great. About her experience. But, um, uh, she was actually in Austin and being held in a homeless camp, um, Mm. which they went and rescued her from that. Okay. Well, how long was she missing before she was found? Do you remember? I'm going to say it was a few weeks. All right. So, okay. All right. Well, I'm glad um, she was tracked down. Okay. So that is what led you to Ohio, even though Allie went missing in Texas. Correct. Okay. And and Amber was very involved in that. Yes. Okay. Let me just ask you a few questions because we're almost here to the end. Um, In retrospect, I just have to ask because I know a lot of listeners are probably want to ask you this question themselves. Do you believe that Allie was really going to get her check that day when she disappeared? I do, yes. Okay. And do you believe it's a coincidence or not, is it a coincidence or not that the day she disappeared was the same day that your your mother wasn't at the house? Um, I kind of go back and forth uh, on on that and what I think because mm-hmm. you know I I know that she's a teenager. You know, mm-hmm. teenagers are going to do what they want, no matter how they figure out how to do it. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't completely not believe that she didn't try to make some other plans. But mm-hmm. um, I do believe that her ultimate plan was to come home that day. Of course. Okay. Uh as the listeners have heard, there's been a couple parts in this interview that have been very difficult for you, so I'm not going to ask you uh, how difficult this has been. We know it's been difficult. Uh, you've shown it right here in the interview, but maybe you can tell the listeners, um, you know, where does the investigation stand right now? Um, any Anything that has popped up? It seems like when Amber was involved, a few things were going on, but I also get the feeling that things have kind of um, unfortunately toned down a little bit. Is that your perception as well, or what's been going on? Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, Amber um, Amber was like my voice. Um, she was uh, my liaison with law enforcement, um, you know, and even though law enforcement treated her like crap, um, you know, everything that she, you know, dug up, whether it be viable or not, you know, there's only so many things that a private investigator can do. It's true. Um, so, you know, she, she did more for me than anybody else had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she looked at, you know, the possibility of Allie being alive and being trafficked, um, versus, you know, law enforcement want to assume that she's dead. Um, and yeah. look for whoever killed her. Yeah. Um, you know, of course it's been 11 years now. Um, of course I've thought of, you know, her not being alive. Um, but with, you know, everything that I have been through and, you know, uh, the different cases that I've worked on, you know, different, uh, aspects, you know, um, search teams and stuff like that, uh, and, looking at other cases until I find a body, then Allie's mm-hmm. alive. Okay. Of course. So, um, you know, there's, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to explain unless you're in someone's shoes like mine. Um, you know, but that's, that's how you make it through every day. Right. You have to, you have to believe that she's going to come home. Joanne, do you have a Facebook page, website, et cetera, set up for Allie's disappearance? If you do, please announce what those are right now. 
Um, yeah, my what my website is Allie's name. It's Alexandria Lowitzer.com. Um, the Facebook page is um, um, oh my gosh, it's Hope for Allie, Alexandria Joy Lowitzer. Okay. And um, you know, I've been able to to help other families and share oh, other yeah. flyers yes. throughout the year. So so I post them on their Facebook page. I've seen that. Okay. Joanne, any final words before we complete this interview? Um, I just, just want to say that it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought that I would be in this position in my entire, entire life. Um, and for parents out there, uh, to think that you would never go through it, um, you're fooling yourself. So what I would like to see is, you know, for missing persons uh, cases to to have more attention. Um, you know, more often than not, you know, I come across other families where they feel like their voices aren't heard and they're not getting the help that they need. Um, and I think, I think it's because thinking of a missing person is, is more inconceivable than having a missing pet. So you see mm -hmm. all these commercials, um, you know, about, you know, help these pets, they need a good home, you know, yeah. uh, but you don't see anything about missing persons no, you don't. and there are so many missing persons out there. Maybe you can get some stats and, and add, you know, how many missing people are out there. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pandemic by itself. If you think about it with the numbers and it if is. nobody talks about it, then nobody's going to know. Uh, I've done some presentations recently at a couple different uh, universities, and the number I'm using, just a very rough round number, is there are like 100,000 unsolved missing persons cases in the United States. Now, that goes back years and years and years and years and years, but it's yeah. about 100,000. Yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. It is crazy. And yeah. the NamUs website... As much as I think they're doing a good job there, it's not, you know, doesn't even have half of them listed there. Uh, my friend Megan with the Charlie Project, she does a fantastic job with her private website with missing persons cases. But, you know, that database uh, is incomplete as well. The number is a yeah. lot higher than either of those databases show. It's, it is a crazy yeah. number. And so yeah. I, cer and you know, I certainly agree with you. Right, right. And, you know, it, it most of it comes down to law enforcement. If law enforcement actually utilizes these tools um and also with uh you know the dna and the genealogy mm -hmm. stuff um mm -hmm. you know because if they, if they don't encourage families to collect dna and enter it into namus then you know their loved one could be a jane or a john yep. doe somewhere um mm -hmm. sitting out there just waiting to be found right and i'm guessing law enforcement does have your dna um, yes, um, yeah. after a couple of times of losing it. Right, that happens too. I've heard about <laughs> that. Okay. Well, yeah. as uh, uh, the listeners should know, Joanne and I, we've known each other for a while, since about 2017. Then just recently we reconnected. You were on my mind. Allie was on my mind. I thought I would give you a call. And it's finally uh, a pleasure to have you on the program. And I hope we uh, can stay in contact a little bit better than I did with you over the last four years. <laughs> So okay. I would, any uh, thing that comes up, any suggestions, any opinions, any insight, you just need someone to talk to, of course, I'm always here. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're ve very welcome, Joanne, and I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my December 2nd, 2021 interview with Joanne Lowitzer, mother of Allie Lowitzer. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. As was stated in the interview, I've created a YouTube video to help explain where Allie got off the bus and where she should have walked on the day she disappeared. I also examine the surrounding area. Please find the analysis 
on the Unfound podcast channel. After the interview was over, I discovered that I never did go back to something that Joanne had said about the burger barn. She inferred, or is it insinuated, that something had gone on there while Allie was working there. So I emailed Joanne, and she wrote back the response. So I'm going to read uh, what she wrote to me. However, I'm going to leave the uh, name that she put in this email out of it. So I'm going to read this right now. What she wrote is, So before Allie went missing, both of her paychecks bounced. And granted, they were not very large at all. John, Allie's father, had to go down there after the first one and get it worked out. After Allie went missing, we had, so this is Joanne talking, we had several people give us information about their experiences with the owner. Someone said that when her and her daughter worked there, they were both assaulted by the owner. My, once again, Joanne talking, Joanne's neighbor behind us said that he asked the owner to translate something in Hebrew, and he couldn't. He said that the owner would brag that he was either Jewish or from Jerusalem, and the one time Joanne met him, he did state something like that. Turns out he was not Jewish. Uh, The owner paid his female employees $2 an hour versus paying the males the minimum wage. He had a slaughterhouse on his home property where he would slaughter his own meat. Goats, I think. His name came up with several different social security numbers. The restaurant closed the 4th of July weekend after Allie went missing. And then just Joanne also said that Amber found a death certificate for him and Joanne thinks that that was in Tennessee. In a second email, a short one, Joanne said the following, uh, This owner was questioned and polygraphed, just like Joanne and her uh, husband, ex-husband, uh, Allie's father was. Uh, Joanne was told that although the owner of the burger barn was strange, the police didn't think he had anything to do with Allie's disappearance. So you can put that into your calculations as you try to figure out what happened to Allie Lowitzer. For me, as I look at Allie's disappearance, I think the most glaring point about the day Allie went missing, and I'm sure this will not be a surprise to any of you, is that it just happened to be the same day that her grandmother wasn't waiting for her at home. The only time her grandmother wasn't waiting for her. Is that a coincidence? The only people who could have known the grandmother wouldn't be there would have been the Lowitzer family, and none of them could ever be considered suspects. In addition, if this were some kind of abduction, the person doing so could not have known Allie would be walking to the burger barn that day. Why? Because Allie herself didn't even know she would be doing that until her mother gave her permission. So, instead of a planned abduction, we must look at an abduction that came out of nowhere. Yes, they happen, but they are rare. In addition, would a person or group really yank a girl they didn't know off a street in broad daylight? Yes, it happens. Jacob Wetterling would be an example of that. But, once again, very rare. What about the possibility of her running off? She did write about it in that diary. Certainly possible, and it's still something to consider. Then there are the texts with Jay. And it's not so much important that he was the last person who communicated with Allie, but the last place her phone pinged was off the tower in her neighborhood. Meaning right after that last text with Jay, her phone either died or it was shut off. As for the sex trafficking theory that has been a part of Allie's disappearance for many years now, 
There is nothing I heard in the interview that leads me to believe Ali was sex trafficked. Nothing. And I've covered in depth about 230 disappearances. Yes, Ali was certainly in the demographic. Female, teenager, alone. Certainly. But any theory has to be backed up with facts, not just with demographics. Moreover, as I've written and talked about before, advocates on any topic tend to exaggerate claims so as to draw attention to their own pet issue. Does sex trafficking happen? Yes. Does it happen with children? Of course. But it's not because these kids are yanked off the streets by strangers. It's because most of the time, their own parents force them into it. And once again, nobody anywhere suspects Allie's family was involved in her disappearance. But what about Aaron and his brother, and the story of that other girl? If there were proof that Allie talked to Aaron or his brother that day, I would entertain the idea. But there is nothing. And I can think of no reason why Allie would go to Aaron's, since it's obvious she didn't like him anyway. The way Joanne explained it, I can't even see Allie getting into a car with him. However, as facts change, theories change. So if something were to pop up with Aaron or his brother, I would take a look at it here 11 to 12 years later. Am I saying the Ohio investigation was a wild goose chase? I realize Allie's family was desperate then, and they are desperate now. And nobody more than myself knows how some leads can sound good, so good, then turn out to be nothing. And any family hates leaving any stone unturned. That's why so many go to psychics and palm readers, even though none of those people have ever solved a disappearance. I understand all of it. Yet, I can't help but say that I don't believe Allie has ever been close to Ohio after her disappearance. Ed, are you saying the solution to Allie's disappearance is still in Spring, Texas? I am. It may be time to backtrack to the beginning of this case. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.